Tell me about your, um, your sort of history with the Cubs from the time you grew up. Did you always follow this team? Yeah, I used to uh, come out here as a boy. I had a great uncle, my grandmother's brother, worked for the Chicago American, and he took me to the pass gate here, the, the press gate, and introduced me to a guy named Tate Johnson, who was uh, the Andy Frayne usher in charge of letting people in free. And uh, from the time I was nine till the time I was 20, I used to just come out here 50, 60 times a summer. What is it about being a Cub fan, though? Oh, I'm, I'm not real sure that you can put your finger on it. Uh, you sort of know that they're going to field a team. You just never really know how. Is it depressing? Is it joyful or, or what? It's, a, it's only depressing if you expect success, like everybody else. You know, if you expect baseball, if you love baseball and you like the town you were born in, you know, then it's okay to be a fan. Did you ever feel like defecting? No, I, I like the Cubs and the White Sox. I like the Chicago teams and, you know, they managed to let us down, I guess, you know, as often as any other sports franchises ever have. But uh, when I moved to Los Angeles, I wasn't quite able to give them up. I think I love baseball more than I love the Cubs, but the reason I love baseball is the Cubs. You know, the, the Cubs are a, a team that need parents or something, you know, they need, need someone to help them. The kids, kids see that, I think, at an early age. As a fan, when the Cubs do screw up, do you get angry? Do you boo? Uh, it doesn't, doesn't pay to boo. They'll be back to screw up some more tomorrow. But why is Wrigley special? I don't know. I, I, there's something about how it feels to come out here in the afternoon and uh, see these grown men do this for a living actually play baseball. You, re you remember it's a game. Sort of describe for those who don't know you uh, what time of performer you are and, and how it's been through the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, well, I started out playing the acoustic guitar and singing these songs in bars in Chicago and other towns 16, 17 years ago. And I guess before that I was in bar bands in high school and played in some rock and roll bands. but. I, I, you know, I make up songs about trains and baseball teams and TV commercials and health food and stuff. I, Would you describe your career as being a successful one? Well, yeah. I mean, that's what I do for a living is sit around and play the acoustic guitar. You just can't beat that. Some people, though, are always sort of looking for one success upon another. How do you gauge success in your business? Well, you know, my favorite song is the next one I'm going to write. Okay, now that's really the best way to have it work. And then you never, never get disappointed by the vagaries of show business. What about sales and, and uh, public acclaim and all that? Is that important? Well, only in that uh, it makes it easy for the guy who has to call up the club or the concert hall and say, well, I got this guy here. He plays the guitar, and we want him to come to your town and sing. You have any money? Right? It makes it easier for the agent if you can get your name out there a little bit. Okay. So you've been happy then, generally, with the way things have gone? Well, I've been very lucky. You know, I've had pretty good success with other people recording my songs. Arlo Guthrie and Judy Collins and David Allen Coe. And I've been very, very fortunate. You know, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. You know, every now and then I write some stuff other people record. Yeah. How about your future? Do you want to change the way you do anything, or are you going to go along being the Steve Goodman as you have been? Well, I really don't know what I could change. You know, I just assume that if you keep doing this, then your number comes up when it does. Right? That's, you has, just keep working at it. Has your number come up, do you think? Well, I got a phone call from Willie Nelson the other day saying that he recorded one of my songs, and that to me is about as good as you can do. When you come here today and look over the field and it's empty and the people working and resodding it, and did you have any kind of feeling, any kind of emotion when you walked up here today and, and looked out on Wrigley? 
made me want to live in this building. Why? Well, there's just nothing like getting up in the morning and climbing up on the roof and seeing a major league ball game. And I don't know why that is, you know. Beats jogging. Did it, uh, did it make you think of anything about uh, the Cubs or your past here or the games you've seen and the games you've enjoyed? Well, right down there at that gate, that's the, where it says employees only now. That's where I used to go in, right next to the ticket booth there. And um, I remember the way the popcorn smelled in the ramp on the way up to the seats. You know, I remember all of that. Did you sit in the bleachers usually when you came out? Well, I split my time between the bleachers and the grandstand right over there. You wrote a song uh, about the, the Cubs and the burial here. Why don't you tell me how that came to be? Yeah, it was a after I'd moved to California and I was coming back here to play a concert and I wanted to have a, a new song to play for the people in Chicago at the concert. And it was during spring training about three years ago. And I had a newspaper and I was looking at the Cub lineup in it. And it, it came to me that you, you can take a, the fan out of Chicago, but you can't take Chicago out of the fan. So I just wrote a song for all the long-suffering Chicago sports fans. When did you write that? Oh, it must be 80, spring of 80. And uh, when you first performed it, what kind of reaction did you get? Well, I played it on the radio station that broadcasts the Cubs. That was the first performance of it. I played it on uh, the Roy Leonard show, on WGN here. And uh, he got a lot of phone calls. And that was the first time anything I'd ever sung had lit up the phones at a radio station, so I thought it was a lot of fun. A lot of people now who maybe don't know you or don't know your Cub allegiance and all the rest will see the story we we'll hear that you have leukemia, and you're singing a song about being buried in Wrigley Field, and they might think, well, gee, does, he, does that have any connection? I mean, did that become... I certainly hope not. <laughs> yeah. It didn't come from, from your feeling... No, I didn't, I didn't perceive myself as, as this old guy. I, you know, I tried to uh, pattern it after the dying crapshooters blues, which is uh, an old blind Willie McTell song. From song the 20s. also by David Romberger. You yeah. bet. Yeah. Well, when you sing it, do you think there'll be there'll come a day when, when what you say in the song will be changed, when, when they won't any longer drop uh, routine flies and, and all that kind of stuff? The Cubs are fugitives from the law of averages. You know, it's bound to catch up with them sooner or later. They're liable to win in spite of themselves. When? When the sun comes up in the west, I don't know when they're going to win. I certainly hope they know. Next year? There's always next year, and that's what Ernie says. Another question about the song. Is this a, is this a song, do you think, that, that non-Cub fans will enjoy, too? And if so, why? Well, as far as I can tell, baseball is still the national pastime. And uh, I think everyone can uh, relate to a a sentiment such as uh, someone who, you know, gave his life to baseball, like this guy in the song.